vision of judgment. St. Peter sat by the celestial bed. His keys were rusty, and the lock was dull. So little trouble had been given of late. Not that the place by any means was full. But since the Gallic era, 88, the devils attain a longer, stronger pull. And a pull altogether, as they say, at sea, which drew most souls another way. The angels all were singing out of tune, and hoarse with having little else to do, excepting to wind up the sun and moon, or curb a runaway young star or two, or wild colt of a comet, which too soon broke out of bounds o'er the ethereal blue, splitting some planet with its playful tail, as boats are sometimes by a wanton whale. The guardian seraphs had retired on high, finding their charges past all care below. Terrestrial business filled naught in the sky, save the recording angel's black bureau, who found, indeed, the facts to multiply with such rapidity of vice and woe that he had stripped off wings in quills, and yet was in arrear of human ills. His business so augmented of late years that he was forced, against his will, no doubt, just like those cherubs, earthly ministers, for some resource to turn himself about and claim the help of his celestial peers to aid him ere he should be quite worn out by the increased demand for his remarks. Six angels and twelve saints were named his clerk. This was a handsome board, at least for heaven, and yet they had even then enough to do. So many conquerors' cars were daily driven, so many kingdoms fitted up anew. Each day two slew its thousands, six or seven, to let the crowning carnage Waterloo. They threw their pens down in divine disgust. The page was so besmeared with blood and dust. This, by the way, tis not mine to record what angels shrink from. Even the very devil on this occasion his own work aboard, so surfeited with the infernal revel, though he himself had sharpened every sword, it almost quenched his innate thirst of evil. Here Satan's sole good work deserves insertion. Tis that he has both generals in reversion. Let's skip a few short years of hollow peace, which peopled earth no better, hell as won't, and heaven none. They form the tyrant's lease, with nothing but new names subscribed upon. Twill one day finish. Meantime they increase, with seven heads and ten horns, and all in front, like St. John's foretold beast but ours are born less formidable in the head than horn. In the first year of freedom's second dawn died George the Third, although no tyrant, one who shielded tyrants, till each sense withdrawn left him nor mental nor external sun. A better farmer ne'er brushed dew from lawn, a worse king never left a realm undone. He died, but left his subjects still behind, one half as mad, and t'other no less blind. He died. His death made no great stir on earth. His burial made some pomp. There was profusion of velvet, gilding, brass, and no great dearth of aught but tears, save those shed by collusion. For these things may be bought at their true worth. Of elegy there was the due infusion, bought also, and the torches, cloaks, and banners, heralds and relics of old Gothic manners formed a sepulchral melodram. Of all the fools who flocked to swell or see the show, who cared about the corpse? The funeral made the attraction, and the black the woe. There throbbed not there a thought which pierced the pall. And when the gorgeous coffin was laid low, it seemed the mockery of hell to fold, the rottenness of eighty years in gold. So mix his body with the dust. It might return to what it must far sooner, were the natural compound left alone to fight its way back into earth and fire and air. But the unnatural balsams merely blight what nature made him at his birth, as bare as the mere millions base unmummied clay, it all his spices but prolonged decay. He's dead, and upper earth with him was done. He's buried, save the undertaker's bill or lapidary scrawl. The world is gone for him, unless he left a German will. But where's the proctor who will ask his son, in whom his qualities are reigning still, except that household virtue most uncommon of constancy to a bad, ugly woman? God save the king! 
It is a large economy in God to save the like. But if he will be saving, all the better, for not one am I of those who think damnation better still. I hardly know too if not quite alone am I in this small hope of bettering future ill by circumscribing with some slight restriction the eternity of hell's hot jurisdiction. I know this is unpopular, I know it is blasphemous. I know one may be damned for hoping no one else may e'er be so. I know my catechism. I know we're crammed with the best doctrines till we quite o'erflow. I know that all save England's church have shammed, and that the other twice two hundred churches and synagogues have made a damned bad purchase. God help us all. God help me too. I am, God knows, as helpless as the devil can wish, and not a whit more difficult to damn than is to bring to land a late-hooked fish or to the butcher to purvey the lamb. Not that I'm fit for such a noble dish, as one day will be that immortal fry of almost everybody born to die. St. Peter sat by the celestial gate and nodded o'er his keys, when, lo, there came a wondrous noise he had not heard of late, a rushing sound of wind and stream and flame, in short, a roar of things extremely great, which would have made aught save a saint exclaim. But he, with first a start and then a wink, said, There's another star gone out, I think. But ere he could return to his repose, a cherub flapped his right wing o'er his eyes, at which St. Peter yawned and rubbed his nose. St. Porter, said the angel, prithee rise. Waving a goodly wing, which glowed as glows an earthly peacock's tail with heavenly dyes, to which the saint replied, Well, what's the matter? Is Lucifer come back with all this clatter? No, quoth the cherub, George the Third is dead. And who is George the Third? replied the apostle. What George? What third? The King of England, said the angel. Well, he won't find kings to jostle him on his way, but does he wear his head? Because the last we saw here had a tussle, and ne'er would have got into heaven's good graces had he not flung his head in all our faces. He was, if I remember, King of France, that head of his, which could not keep a crown on earth, yet ventured in my face to advance a claim to those of martyrs like my own. If I had had my sword, as I had once, when I cut ears off, I had cut him down. But, having but my keys, and not my brand, I only knocked his head from out his hand. And then he set up such a headless howl, that all the saints came out and took him in. And there he sits by St. Paul, cheek by jowl. That fellow Paul, the parvenu, the skin of St. Bartholomew, which makes his cowl in heaven, and upon earth redeemed his sin, so as to make a martyr, never sped better than did this weak and wooden head. But had it come up here upon its shoulders, there would have been a different tale to tell. The fellow feeling in the saint's beholders seems to have acted on them like a spell, and so this very foolish head heaven's shoulders back on its trunk. It may be very well, and seems the custom here to overthrow whatever has been wisely done below. The angel answered, Peter, do not pout. The king who comes has head and all entire, and never knew much what it was about. He did as doth the puppet, by its wire, and will be judged like all the rest, no doubt. My business, and your own, is not to inquire into such matters, but to mind our cue, which is to act as we are bid to do. While thus they spake, the angelic caravan, arriving like a rush of mighty wind, cleaving the fields of space, as doth the swan some silver stream, say Ganges, Nile, or Ind, or Thames, or Tweed, and midst them an old man with an old soul, and both extremely blind, halted before the gate, and in his shroud seated their fellow traveller on a cloud. But bringing up the rear of this bright host, a spirit of a different aspect waved his wings, like thunderclouds above some coast whose barren beach with frequent wrecks is paved. His brow was like the deep when tempest tossed. Fierce and unfathomable thoughts engraved eternal wrath on his immortal face, and where he gazed a gloom pervaded space. As he drew near, he gazed upon the gate, ne'er to be entered more by him or sin, with such a glance of supernatural hate as made St. Peter wish himself within. He pottered with his keys at a great rate, and sweated through his apostolic skin, of course his perspiration was but ichor, or some such other spiritual liquor. 
The very cherubs huddled all together, like birds when soars the falcon, and they felt a tingling to the tip of every feather, and formed a circle like Orion's belt around their poor old charge, who scarce knew whither his guards had led him, though they gently dealt with royal manes. For by many stories, and true, we learn the angels all are Tories. As things were in this posture, the gate flew asunder, and the flashing of its hinges flung over space an universal hue of many-coloured flame, until its tinges reached even our speck of earth, and made a new aurora borealis spread its fringes o'er the North Pole, the same scene when ice bound by Captain Parry's crew in Melville's Sound. And from the gate thrown open issued beaming a beautiful and mighty thing of light, Radiant with glory, like a banner streaming, Victorious from some world o'erthrowing fight. My poor comparisons must needs be teeming With earthly likenesses, For here the night of clay obscures our best conceptions, Saving Joanna Southcote, or Bob Southey raving. Twas the archangel Michael. All men know the make of angels and archangels, Since there's scarce a scribbler has not one to show, From the fiend's leader to the angel's print. There also are some altarpieces, though I really can't say that they much evince one's inner notions of immortal spirits. But let the connoisseurs explain their merits. Michael flew forth in glory and in good, a goodly work of him from whom all glory and good arise. The portal passed, he stood. Before him, the young cherubs and saints hoary, I say young, begging to be understood, by looks, not years and should be very sorry to state they were not older than St. Peter, but merely that they seemed a little sweeter. The cherubs and the saints bowed down before that arch-angelic hierarch, the first of essences angelical, who wore the aspect of a god. But this ne'er nursed pride in his heavenly bosom, in whose core no thought save for his master's service durst intrude, however glorified and high, he knew him but the viceroy of the sky. He and the sombre silent spirit met. They knew each other both for good and ill. Such was their power that neither could forget his former friend and future foe. But still there was a high, immortal, proud regret in either's eye, as if to a less their will than destiny to make the eternal years their date of war and their champ clos the spheres. But here they were in neutral space, we know from Job that Satan hath the power to pay a heavenly visit thrice a year or so, and that the sons of God, like those of clay, must keep him company. And we might show from the same book in how polite a way the dialogue is held between the powers of good and evil, but would take up ours. And this is not a theologic tract, to prove with Hebrew and with Arabic if Job be allegory or a fact, but a true narrative. And thus I pick from out the whole but such and such an act, as sets aside the slightest thought of trick. Tis every tittle true, beyond suspicion, and accurate as any other vision. The spirits were in neutral space, before the gate of heaven, like eastern thresholds is the place where death's grand cause is argued o'er, and souls dispatched to that world or to this. And therefore Michael and the other wore a civil aspect, though they did not kiss, Yet still between his darkness and his brightness there passed a mutual glance of great politeness. The archangel bowed, not like a modern bow, but with a graceful oriental bend, pressing one radiant arm just where below the heart in good men is supposed to tend. He turned as to an equal, not too low, but kindly. Satan met his ancient friend with more hauteur, as might an old Castilian, poor noble meet a mushroom-rich civilian. He merely bent his diabolic brow an instant, and then raising it he stood in act to assert his right or wrong, and show cause why King George by no means could or should make out a case to be exempt from woe eternal, more than other kings, endued with better sense and hearts, whom history mentions, who long have paved hell with their good intentions. Michael began. What wouldst thou with this man, now dead and brought before the Lord? What ill hath he wrought since his mortal race began, that thou canst claim him? Speak, and do thy will, 
if it be just, if in this earthly span he hath been greatly failing to fulfill his duties as a king, and mortal, say, and he is thine. If not, let him have way. Michael, replied the Prince of Air, even here before the gate of him thou servest, must I claim my subject, and will make appear that as he was my worshipper in dust, so shall he be in spirit, although dear to thee and thine, because nor wine nor lust were of his weaknesses, yet on the throne he reigned o'er millions to serve me alone. Look to our earth, or rather mine. It was once more thy master's, but I triumph not in this poor planet's conquest, nor, alas, need he thou servest envy me my lot. With all the myriads of bright worlds which pass in worship round him, he may have forgot yon weak creation of such paltry things. I think few worth damnation save their kings. And these but as a kind quit-rent to assert my right as lord, and even had I such an inclination, twere, as you well know, superfluous. They are grown so bad that hell has nothing better left to do than leave them to themselves. So much more mad and evil by their own internal curse, heaven cannot make them better, nor I worse. Look to the earth, I said, and say again, when this old, blind, mad, helpless, weak, poor worm began in youth's first bloom and flush to reign, the world and he both wore a different form, and much of earth and all the watery plain of ocean called him king. Through many a storm his isles had floated on the abyss of time, for the rough virtues chose them for their clime. He came to his sceptre young, he leaves it old, looked to the state in which he found his realm, and left it, and his annals too behold how to a minion first he gave the helm, how grew upon his heart a thirst for gold, the beggar's vice, which can but overwhelm the meanest hearts, and for the rest but glance thine eye along America and France. Tis true, he was a tool from first to last, I have the workman safe, but as a tool so let him be consumed. From out the past of ages, since mankind have known the rule of monarchs, from the bloody rolls amassed of sin and slaughter, from the Caesar's school, take the worst pupil, and produce a reign more drenched with gore, more cumbered with the slain. He ever warred with freedom and the free, nations as men, home subjects, foreign foes, so that they uttered the word liberty, found George the Third their first opponent. Whose history was ever stained as his will be with national and individual woes? I grant his household abstinence, I grant his neutral virtues, which most monarchs want. I know he was a constant consort, own he was a decent sire and middling lord. All this is much, and most upon a throne. As temperance, if at a picious board, is more than at an anchorite's supper shown, I grant him all the kindest can accord. And this was well for him, but not for those millions who found him what oppression chose. The new world shook him off, the old yet groans beneath what he and his prepared, if not completed. He leaves heirs on many thrones to all his vices, without what begot compassion for him, his tame virtues. Drones who sleep, or despots who have now forgot a lesson which shall be retaught them, wake upon the thrones of earth, but let them quake. Five millions of the primitive, who hold the faith which makes ye great on earth, implored a part of that vast all they held of old, freedom to worship, not alone your lord, Michael, but you, and you, St. Peter. Cold must be your souls, if you have not abhorred the foe to Catholic participation in all the license of a Christian nation. True, he allowed them to pray God, but as a consequence of prayer, refused the law which would have placed them upon the same base with those who did not hold the saints in awe. But here St. Peter started from his place, and cried, You may the prisoner withdraw, ere heaven shall ope her portals to this gelf, while I am guard, may I be damned myself. Sooner will I with Cerberus exchange my office, and his is no sinecure, 
then see this royal bedlam bigot range the azure fields of heaven, of that be sure. Saint, replied Satan, you do well to avenge the wrongs he made your satellites endure. And if to this exchange you should be given, I'll try to coax our Cerberus up to heaven. Here Michael interposed. Good saint and devil, pray not so fast. You both outrun discretion. Saint Peter, you will want to be more civil. Satan, excuse this warmth of his expression and condescension to the vulgar's level. Even saints sometimes forget themselves in session. Have you got more to say? No. Please, I'll trouble you to call your witnesses. Then Satan turned and waved his swarthy hand, which stirred with its electric qualities clouds farther off than we can understand, although we find him sometime in our skies. Infernal thunder shook both sea and land, in all the planets and hell's batteries, let off the artillery, which Milton mentions as one of Satan's most sublime inventions. This was a signal unto such damned souls as have the privilege of their damnation extended far beyond the mere controls of worlds past, present, or to come. No station is theirs particularly in the roles of hell assigned, but where their inclination or business carries them in search of game, they may range freely, being damned the same. They're proud of this, as very well they may, it being a sort of knighthood or gilt key stuck in their loins, or like to an entree up the back stairs, or such freemasonry. I borrow my comparisons from clay, being clay myself. Let not those spirits be offended with such base low likenesses. We know their posts are nobler far than these. 